Can you, can you hear me on this mic okay? Yeah. All right, so I'll just use this one. Awesome. Uh, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to stay cozy to this desk here. We, uh, a couple questions first, so I understand uh, who we're talking to. How, how many of you are students versus, we'll say, professionals? Is that students? And then professionals? Um, and then everyone else, if you, if you don't want to, okay. That's, Good, so most people have jobs, that's great. Or they're spending lots of money on loans, that's good. Uh, and how many people have heard of Beam? Apache Beam? All right, a handful. Google Cloud Dataflow? All right. Um, uh, Apache Spark? Okay, great. So, uh, and then maybe one last, uh, a preference between Java or Python. How many are Java? And Python? Okay. We'll spend a little more time on the Python, I guess. So I, I wanted to get, first give us some background on, on, on uh, Beam and Dataflow. So it all starts in 2004, right, with the MapReduce paper from Google. And then if it, within Google, we continued to iterate on MapReduce, make improvements. There was Flume and Millwill, if you follow those papers. Meanwhile, in the open source community, uh, the MapReduce paper, as well as a, other innovations spawned a whole world around Hadoop and then more recently Spark. So maybe a couple years ago, this is kind of what the landscape looked like, uh, at least for us internally at Google. But there were still, you might think there's a lot of tools out there, we've kind of solved a lot of problems, this is a good place to be. But we still saw some work to be done. Uh, one is how you write big data jobs. Uh, there, there was no, um, there, was, there was stream frameworks, there was batch frameworks. Are these necessary? Uh, event time processing. Um, most of the frameworks available provided only uh, the arrival time of the system processing, not event time processing. And then job portability. With all these frameworks, if you write to one, then you have to rewrite it a year later when the next popular framework comes out. Or if you want to move frameworks for a use case, you have to learn them all. So that's how you write a job. Uh, we also saw some issues with how jobs are run. The, just the operations of running a big data system in a company is a lot of work. And then um, performance. Uh, straggling workers specifically was, is a problem that's been around since the beginning that we have yet to solve. So th these are some of the things we wanted to tackle. And so rather than writing a paper at Google, we, we released a product. So this is Google Cloud Dataflow, which is a, an execution engine similar to Spark or Flink or Hadoop. And then also as part of that effort, we released an, uh, an open source project, which is now incubating at the Apache Foundation called Beam. And, and just so I don't lose you, Beam is a, an API. It's how you write a job. But you, you don't necessarily execute a job with Beam. You would then execute it on one of these other engines, like Dataflow. So if I were to, to map these projects to the problems they're solving, Beam is helping solve how you, how you write a job, and Dataflow is, is solving how you execute a job. All right, so we're going we're gonna to talk about um, event time processing, job portability. We're going to talk about Beam first. Uh, we all have data. Some of us have lots of data. And traditionally, when we have lots of data, we break it into pieces. We, we partition it so that we can save it someplace. But really, all data is just a stream. And, and uh, because it's a stream, it's infinitely large because it goes on forever. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't come in order usually. So as data arrives to your stream processing system, uh, there are network latencies that are on the way or other things that put events out of order. So um, usually we just ignore that. And in the batch world, we've just, we still truncate our data by the time it arrives to the system into groups, which works fine until you want to recreate a user session, for example. Um, and and the, the rest, what we talk about for the next five or 10 minutes is, is a lot about session analysis, which is a particularly hairy problem um, that Beam helps with. So you'll see here, if you, if you partition your data by time and a, session, and a session extends over that amount of time, it's hard to recreate. So maybe you go to streaming to solve this problem. Um, you, might, you might first filter some data, then you start aggregating by time again. But as, as before, now that you're in a stream, you might think I can, I can put events in the proper order. So here I'm, I'm taking events um, 
that, that arrive between 12 and 13, and I'm putting them at 11 and 12, where they actually occurred. And because I can do that, I now uh, can recreate a session. So I'm just speaking conceptually here so far. I haven't told you that this is possible or how it's possible. But if you were to do operations on streams, this is, this is the type of work you probably want to do. In order to do that, we need to introduce some new concepts that end up in Beam. So the first is, um, I, I talked about event time and processing time. So this is when the event actually occurred and this is when it hits your system. Um, to put things in order, we need, we need to know when uh, the data has actually arrived. Because in theory, data could be forever late. It could never arrive. Uh, so at some point, we need to make a heuristic decision that says, oh, the data is probably mostly here. I can begin an aggregation. I can, I can compute something. So that's what the watermark here is. Um, and, uh, or, or I should say, the red line is when data arrives. Sometimes it's, it's delayed a bit. We call that skew. And um, ideally, we have a watermark or something that says, the data is probably here. You can proceed with the calculation. Um, those, are, those are some concepts in Beam. And I'm, forgive me, I'm kind of rushing through this uh, so we can get to the, the Python stuff that I think people might more prefer. OK, so now I'm introducing you to the Beam SDK. So this is currently in Java. We also have some in Python. Uh, but this is kind of simplified Java. Otherwise, it wouldn't fit on a slide. So, uh, so that we can, this is a simple batch job. I'm just going to count up what happened in a certain hour. So um, a P collection, if you're familiar with Spark, is like an RDD. It's just a parallelized connection. It's a big bag of data. I'm going to read into a P collection. I'm going to parse it. And um, I'm going to uh, sum integers of a key. So here's what that looks like graphically. Um, I have event time on bottom, processing time on the side. That line is like the ideal watermark. If everything arrived on time, you see nothing is arriving on time. You know, three comes in. Oop, I, I went too quickly there. Um, three is close on time. Nine's really late. It doesn't matter because I'm doing this in batch, and I just count all the data at the same time. This is how we usually do things. Um, but if I if I wanted to partition the data into smaller groups, which I have to do if I want to do stream processing, I need windows. Or uh, so there, there's several kinds of windows. I have a fixed window, which is just counting every minute or every hour. Uh, a sliding window is like a trailing five minutes, a trailing hour. Um, and then sessions we've discussed. So the, the Beam SDK gives you some primitives to apply a window to either a stream or a batch of data. Um, so you just say, I, I want a window of, a fixed window of, uh, in this case, two minutes. So, so here is your fixed window of two minutes. So far, this is looking pretty comfortable, makes sense, right? You, you, and then you can add them all up if you want the full hour. Um, that, that's our simple batch world. Now if we want to consider um, events as they arrive, we have to make a decision about what's late, what's not late. We're, we're back to our watermark. Um, a trigger controls when the watermark, or I'm sorry, when a window is executed and you get results. So, um, and, and watermarks move um, move trigger, or, uh, triggers move with watermarks. So here we have, I've added a trigger. Uh, we're, we're building on the same application here. So I, I have the, the two minute windows. And now I'm saying whenever you see a watermark, trigger the window, do the aggregation, which is in this case a sum of integers. OK, so if I was able to calculate a perfect watermark, meaning I knew when data was going to be late, I might be able to do something like this. I don't know when data is going to be late, so in this case, I'm going to miss number nine. I thought I had all the data, nine came late, I missed it. A, a way to, if you wanted to capture nine, the, the Beam SEK gives you primitives to then say, oh, actually, you should, you should go and um, uh, fire that, fi maybe you want to speculate about a window early. So I want to calculate a window, and then if I find more data comes, I want to go recalculate that window. So here I've added um, a late firing. You're seeing that I've now captured number nine. At first I missed it. Um, and uh, I, I executed the window early. And then when it came again, I executed it late. So now I, I can get my data fast, and I can get my data accurate over time. 
So the Beam SDK offers several primitives to, to handle late arriving data. You can just um, discard it if it's late. You can accumulate it. You can eventually, we hope to allow you to um, be able to retract an answer and then um, only write the, the true answer. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so this, so this is, uh, if we supported retracting, um, this gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. It's basically, every time I get um, a new record, I'm gonna update my downstream data, and uh, if I have better information, I'm gonna retract my old answer and write, it, write the new one. The reason why I went through all these is I wanted to show you that um, regardless of how, which system you use, uh, I haven't told you how we're gonna execute this, actually. I've just told you how you'd want to describe your big data job. And um, it's possible with the same primitives to describe both batch and streaming jobs. So I, I, we had classic batch at first, and then we introduced more real-time streaming elements. And then towards the end, we had very, um, very active streaming operations, um, all with the same SDK. And that's, that's the promise of uh, Beam. So Beam is a job description framework, currently in Java, and eventually and very soon actually also in Python, I'll show you some Python, um, that is independent of how you actually execute the data. So whether you're using batch or stream, you can uh, write a Beam job and then choose to execute it on your favorite framework of choice. Uh, so if you've, if you've already invested in Spark, if you want to try out Flink, um, or I work on Google Cloud Dataflow, uh, which is a cloud-based service. And actually, that's what I'll talk about next. So I've, I've told you how we've we solved these, or at least attempted to solve these first problems we saw with Beam. So now these later problems, um, performance and operations. Uh, anyone familiar with straggling workers? Um, this idea of like, okay, so, so in MapReduce or any kind of distributed computation framework, you, uh, you deploy several VMs or workers to do a task, I'm trying to think of other nodes. Um, and you give them all a chunk of work to do, but inevitably there's this, this one or two that goes really long. Um, there's several reasons for that. It's, it's generally, you either gave them too much work and you didn't realize it, or they're just slow. Uh, you have a bad machine or something. Um, and this, this has kind of been a plague, even though we, we can do all this work to optimize, but you're only as fast as those slowest workers. You can't continue to the next stage until all the data's back. So the way most systems have tackled these is, uh, we filter for bad machines is an option. So you could spin up a VM, and if it appears slow after a few checks, you, you just get rid of it. Don't give it work. Um, another option is, is speculative execution, uh, which is a fancy way of just saying you just run these, you, 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 you start, uh, you take the long jobs, and you run them again, hoping that uh, they might finish faster. And whoever finishes first, you take those results. So what, what we're doing um, at, Data flow, oh, okay, is what we, we call it dynamic work rebalancing publicly. Internally, we like to call it liquid sharding, which we think is a kind of a cooler term, but marketing didn't like that. So it's dynamic work rebalancing. And the idea is you take these long workers. Um, at, well, well, at any given point in time, we're going to assess how long is, do we expect this job to take. And if I'm not, make, if I'm not making much progress, I'm probably not going to finish on time, um, speaking from a worker's point of view. Let's, let's cut, split the work, and redistribute it to the workers who are done. That seems like a straightforward solution. Like, why haven't we been doing that in the past? Well, it's, it's hard to know where you can split work. Uh, and, and you can't just arbitrarily split work. You have to uh, split it along actual discrete data piece, pieces. So uh, this required us to not use the traditional Hadoop input-output formats. So if we needed to know more data from the source about where we can split. Um, so if, if you want dynamic work rebalancing, you have, to, you have to have new input output. So we bake those into Beam. Um, so everybody can use the, the uh, more granular information about input output available in Beam for your runner. Currently, it's um, data flow supports it. Okay. And, and this is the results. So on the left are, it's a, it's a usual job. You can see all the straggling workers. And on the right, you're seeing um, when we implement dynamic work rebalancing, you can see like a, a, a kind of a vertical line there where we made the shift, where we like shuffled the work. 
for example. OK, so that's, that's how we're speeding up uh, performance. Operations, uh, the usual way of, of deploying these big data clusters is you, you deploy a cluster. You dedicate a certain number of machines to, to Spark or Flink or Hadoop. Um, and then if you want to execute a job, you execute a job on the cluster. And so you end up with this kind of dual um, hierarchy where uh, you, you have your, your cluster and your job. In the world of the cloud or ephemeral uh, compute, this doesn't make as, as much sense. Like your, your, your cluster is as big as Amazon or Google. Um, and, and then how do you auto scale uh, these two things? So, so traditionally, you auto scale them by having both infrastructure scaling and, and job scaling. Um, because you have these two boundaries, you need to auto scale them both. Um, and the infrastructure doesn't have the same signals as the job, so it's, it's hard to auto scale. You're left to just using kind of like a CPU utilization, kind of raw metrics. So the approach we've taken um, in Dataflow is that you, there's no cluster. So uh, you, you just submit a job directly to the cloud. Uh, it consumes as many resources as it needs, um, and then it tears itself down when it's done. There's nobody at your office that's dedicated to just babysitting the cluster. Um, data engineers submit their own work, and, and it just works. Uh, this gives us additional auto-scaling metrics at the job level. So because the job, it only exists as the job, we can auto-scale that better. Um, and we also use dynamic work rebalancing to auto-scale better. It's hard to add a node during a stage if, if you can't give work to that node because all the work is stuck on other machines. So we can um, add a node, uh, dynamic work rebalance work to that node, and we can auto scale mid stage. So that, sorry, that's a little bit in the weeds. I, I mean, the high level story is that um, I, having a, a cloud first approach to data processing allows you to, to do some things that, um, if, we, if we disregard the kind of on premise traditional model. Okay, so other operations. Um, we talked about this being like a batch and streaming framework. So you're, you deploy your, your batch job. You don't need to cluster. You just deploy your batch job. And, and it's running great. Now you want to update it. You want to make a change. You're, you're kind of stuck at this point because um, it's, it's hard to, to take down your streaming job and put up your new streaming job. Or do you leave up your streaming job and move the data over? The, the usual options are these two. So you have a parallel swap or you have a stop and restart. Um, both of them are kind of operationally complex. And if you're doing this all the time, you'll probably script or automate this. Um, but it still doesn't leave you with some important results. Like you, you're not going to preserve your write pattern. You may introduce duplication. Um, you may miss new data. So uh, the approach we're advocating with Dataflow is an update in place. Um, so we, we manage the state from job one to job two, and you can easily transition just with a single command. Just say, here's my new job. Um, we manage the state transition, and, uh, and you're off and running in place. Th this works for, the, for several changes, but not all changes, and we're, we're working to expand that to, to handle more changes. OK, so I've talked to you a little about Dataflow. I just wanted to put this in place in case you, you didn't follow what I meant by Dataflow. So Dataflow is a um, one of several Google Cloud products, uh, similar to Amazon Web Services. Um, it's, it's the batch and streaming combined service there in the center. Um, and it's based on Google's years of, of MapReduce, and it contains some of the features we just described. OK, I think I'm doing OK on time, I believe. Our, uh, so we have maybe five minutes here for just a quick demo. Um, I've got here a, a, just a notebook. I've generated some, a few rows of data. You can see some timestamps, price, product name. This is like an inventory data. Uh, j just to give you a feel for how you might write a, a beam pipeline and then ex execute it on Dataflow. So uh, I'll bring in the Dataflow library here. First, I instantiate a pipeline. And I, I've said it's going to be on the direct pipeline runner, which just means it's going to run locally. And then I'm going to describe my 
DAG, the operations I'm going to apply on this. So I'm just going to read from my input file and write to an output file. I'm not actually doing anything. <laughs> I'm just moving data around as an example. Uh, and then I, oh, excuse me, hang on. Let me start from the top because I don't think I, Okay. Sorry, guys. I may have lost my internet connection. Well, let, let me uh, jump down here. All right. So I described my processing graph. Um, Okay, I'm going to step through this because I, I really just want to show you running on the service. All right, so here's a pipeline that I might run on the, on the data flow service. So here I'm doing, a, I'm reading from an input file, um, applying a, oh no, actually, forgive me guys. I'm, I'm low on time, so I'm, I'm skipping around here. Okay, so this is a word count on, on some Shakespeare text. Here I'm just going to read from Shakespeare. Um, I'm doing a split uh, at each of the words. So I'm finding the, the spaces and doing a split of the words. Um, and then I'm going to do, I have a combiner, which is kind of like a group by key type thing, where I count all the words. And then finally I'm going to write the output um, to a file. If I want to then execute this on the service, I need to specify a project. And let's see. I'll, I'll see if this is going to work. I'm getting some errors, but I'm going to give this a try anyway. OK. Oh, so this is executing. All right, so I'm now executing this on the Dataflow service. I'm going to jump over to the Cloud Console. Here's a previous job I ran. Let's go see if our new job is going to come in. There it is. Okay, so this job just showed up. So you, you, as I said earlier, you don't have a cluster here. The job is being deployed directly to the service. I pull up that job and you can see the, um, the operations that we just described. Here's where you can monitor your pipeline. Um, I'm, I'm reading from text, I'm splitting, I'm counting, and I'm writing. Now, each of these transforms is implemented by other transforms. So a count is really a, a map and a reduce. And then this write transform is, um, is actually fairly complicated because uh, in order to make sure I get all the data, I'm going to write to temporary files. And then I have this finalized step that says, OK, all the temporary files were written appropriately. I've got all the data. Now let's write a single file as my output. So this is all running. And if you're curious how it's running, I can bump over to uh, this is Compute Engine. And I can see this instance group. This is my group of VMs that have been deployed uh, to run this job. I don't need to do anything here. I'm just, just so you get a feel for what's going on. So I'm going to bump back into this thing. Uh, Meanwhile, let me show you, I don't think this is done yet, but this is the output for the sake of time you'd expect. So um, I split all the words, uh, sophisticated, uh, pinch large, and I've counted how often those occurred in King Lear. Um, so that, that was a very simple pipeline. This, this is more of the pipelines that our, our uh, customers typically run and that, that Beam users typically run. This is kind of like a, a business intelligence type pipeline where you're reading from a database, doing a several aggregations and joins, and then you're writing to another ad database. Let me see if I can zoom out. You can see this whole DAG here. Perfect. So I'm going to go check back. So our, our job completed. Um, it, it took about two and a half minutes. Most of that time is just spinning up and tearing down VMs because there's not actually a lot of work being done. 
So there's a quick pass at uh, data flow and beam. And forgive me for, for moving quickly. So um, in summary, beam is a, uh, an emerging Apache project, job description framework that um, is portable. It can run on any, uh, in theory, any, any execution framework. Currently, uh, it supports Flink, Spark, Dataflow, and we have several other, um, several other frameworks that the open source community is looking at supporting. Uh, and, then, and then Dataflow is an execution engine um, that employs kind of cloud-first, cloud-native approaches to performance and optimization that we're excited about that you can execute using Beam. Um, so, uh, I think I have like maybe five minutes for questions, and so let me let me I'll just stop there and, and take any questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's. Um, Fundamentally, it's, it's uh, the ability to know where I can split records intermediate to a file, for example. Um, so no, if, if I have several files, the traditional approach is to assign one per worker. Um, and so my worker count is, is a function of my, the way my data is organized. Um, and uh, what, what Beam does is it takes in the data, um, establishes what an individual record looks like, and then it's, it's willing to, to split at those record breaks rather than file breaks. Is that? This is something in the data to indicate where breaks can occur, right? Yeah, yeah. So this isn't possible with all sources. Um, and so uh, we, we have connectors for a few sources. And then others, we, we have to operate kind of in the traditional um, like for certain file types, we have to operate in the traditional Hadoop style. Yeah. Yeah. Primarily to um, suggest that you probably don't need a lambda architecture. I guess that was the motivation, or yeah. So, so that's a, that's a way of describing the motivation. Um, so the, the lambda architecture, for those unfamiliar, is this idea that if you want your data fast and you want it accurate, you need two systems, one that specializes in fast and one and it's traditionally like a streaming system, which may not have the right data guarantees. It may be like uh, we may process data multiple times, incidentally. Um, and then your batch system is, is exactly once and, and it's more accurate. Uh, yes, so th this, this is an alternative to the lambda architecture, where a single system um, can give you uh, a real-time stream and also guarantee exactly once processing um, and, and the ability to, to know, like your results can always be accurate because we can get the late data and the, and the fast data. And this is already available in uh, data flow? This is, this is available today, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Can you speak to the, the completeness, of the, just the completeness of the Flink and Spark implementations? I know that when my team was adopting it, we were we were stuck using Google Cloud, and uh, great, yeah, no, which is I, good for you, I'm sure. But yeah, that, that I, I kind of hand waved over like support for Spark and Flink. So we work closely with Flink, and and the Flink implementation is um, is much further along than, for example, the Spark implementation. Um, the Spark implementation is making lots of progress. I believe it's still currently batch only for Spark, um, and and we're in the midst of I shouldn't I shouldn't say we the community is in the midst of streaming support. Does that answer your question? I mean, kind of. I mean, yeah. Because the position really is what is, is uh, how much is Google invested in that and how much are, because I mean there's, Dataflow is the first one, is the first target platform for yeah. it and there's a risk that it will, in order for it to be a healthy project in the long run, the other runners have to have a substantial, I mean, they have, there have to be alternatives for being to be a truly uh, universal execution framework and not just a, uh, a Google project. No, I, 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 we, we fully agree that the success of Beam lies in, in several runner stable, strong, run successful runner implementations. Um, so, so we're committed to do whatever is necessary to, to get into that point. Um, we also want to work with the community to make sure that 
uh, there are people who are also committed in supporting these. Uh, we don't want to just throw things over the fence to get hub and let them rot. Yeah. Great. Uh, th this is this is entire. This is 100% our our goal and vision for Dataflow. Right now, there's a lot of knobs generally with data. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, repeating the question. So the the question was, um, I, I maybe to summarize. I think I'd like to be able to specify when I want my job done and and the amount I'm willing to pay for it generally, and let the let a service decide how and when it's executed. Is that well, not just that, but also say, like, if I, I'm willing to pay an extra million dollars to increase my odds of being done by this time by 10%. Mm -hmm. So actually be able to, you know, like, it's a statistical thing. My odds of being done by a certain time, and how much more I'm willing to pay to increase those odds. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll answer your question by saying we, we want to create a world where you don't, um, you don't have to think in terms of workers, you don't have to estimate how long it takes your job to be done, and how much you're willing, or, or uh, you should only have to think in the terms you're describing, which is, um, this is how important this job is to me, here's how much I'm willing to pay for it, and, and the service should be able to automate those things for you. Uh, we're, we're headed partially in that direction, we've released, um, auto scaling is on by default starting next week or the following. Um, which gets you out of the business of choosing the, the worker count. Uh, but we still haven't given you the ability to say, here's how much I'm willing to pay, here's my, um, when I want it done, and, and, and statistically this is the relationship between the two. But, but we want to go in that direction, so. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah. I think we have concluded the question-answer round. If you still have any questions, you can catch up with Eric outside the